विदेशी तक हम भारत के लोग हम भारत के लोग भारत को भारत को एक संपूर्ण एक संपूर्ण प्रभुत्व संपन्न प्रभुत्व संपन्न समाजवादी समाजवादी पंथ निर्देश पंथ निर्देश लोकतंत्रात्मक राज्य बनाने के लिए तथा उसके समस्त नागरिकों को तथा उसके समस्त नागरिकों को सामाजिक सामाजिक आर्थिक आर्थिक और राजनीतिक न्याय और राजनीतिक न्याय विचार विचार अभिव्यक्ति अभिव्यक्ति विश्वास विश्वास धर्म धर्म और उपासना की स्वतंत्रता और उपासना की स्वतंत्रता प्रतिष्ठा प्रतिष्ठा और अवसर की समता और अवसर की समता प्राप्त कराने के लिए प्राप्त कराने के लिए तथा उन सब में व्यक्ति की गरिमा व्यक्ति की गरिमा और राष्ट्र की एकता और राष्ट्र की एकता और अखंडता और अखंडता सुनिश्चित करने वाली बंधुता सुनिश्चित करने वाली बंधुता बढ़ाने के लिए बढ़ाने के लिए दृढ़ संकल्प होकर दृढ़ संकल्प होकर अपनी इस संविधान सभा में अपनी इस संविधान सभा में आज तारीख छब्बीस नवम्बर उन्नीस सौ उनचास ईस्वी नीति मार्ग शीर्ष शुक्र सप्तमी संवत दो हजार छह वित्तवी दो हजार छह वित्तवी को एजन द्वारा इस संविधान को इस संविधान को अंगीकृत अंगीकृत अधिनियमित अधिनियमित और आत्मार्पित करते हैं और आत्मार्पित करते हैं थैंक यू the 26th of January, 1950, the people of our country, through their accredited representatives, have redeemed a solemn pledge. A pledge made some 20 years ago in distant Lahore. A pledge which brings into being a new nation. A new nation, but with an ancient heritage. A republic that once again takes its rightful place among the freedom-loving countries of the world. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, do hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. But to the common man of India, that is you, and you, and you, and you. What exactly do these words signify? They mean that henceforth, each one of us will have the fundamental rights of equality before the law, equality of opportunity in matters of public appointment, abolition of untouchability, the rights to freedom of speech and expression, protection of life and personal liberty, prohibition of traffic in human beings and forced labor, freedom of religion, protection of minorities, and many other safeguards. These safeguards, which are the very bulwarks of democracy, have been guaranteed to us in the written constitution. The drafting of our new constitution has been no easy task. And before its first word was put on paper, the notable constitutions of other countries were first consulted. These constitutions can be classified under two categories, the unitary and the federal. Our constitution is in large measure of the federal type, and the federating units are many and varied. They consist of one, states formerly known as provinces. Two, the newly created unions of states, 
and the old states of Hyderabad, Mysore, and Kashmir. Three, the chief commissioner's provinces. Each one of us living within a state, regardless of occupation or sex, has the right of sending representatives to the state assembly as well as to the central legislature. If then 75,000 of us of any state get together, and provided we are over 21, we have the right of collectively electing one representative to the state assembly. According to the present divisions of the country, there will be a maximum of 500 and a minimum of 60 representatives in each of the state assemblies. Now the procedure of electing a representative to the central legislature is slightly different. Uh, more of us have to get together. In fact, 10 times as many. And between us, we send one representative to the central legislature. Here also, there are no class or sex restrictions. But we must be over the age of 21 to have the power to vote. There will be about 500 members elected, and they will form the House of the People. 205 members will be elected from the state assemblies. These two houses, along with the president, will be called the parliament. Parliament on the one hand and state assemblies on the other will combine to elect the president. The vice president will be elected by vote of parliament alone. And he will be the ex officio chairman of the council of states. Immediately upon his election, the president will call upon the leader of the majority party in the House of the People to accept the office of Prime Minister. The Prime Minister will then choose his cabinet from among his colleagues. The president will select 12 persons who are acknowledged leaders in their respective spheres, such as in the arts, science, agriculture, and so on, and nominate them to the Council of State. The president will also nominate the state governors, but the governors will be purely constitutional heads, for the real business of conducting the states will be carried on by the premier and his cabinet. Like the centre, the state legislature in the six major states of Bihar, Bombay, Madras, Punjab, the United Provinces, and West Bengal will consist of two houses. The other states will have one house only. The state legislature must meet twice a year, at intervals of not more than six months, and it can legislate on 66 different matters. The most important of them are law and order, health, agriculture, fisheries, education, entertainment. The central government, on the other hand, can legislate on 97 different items, the most important of which are defense, foreign affairs, communication, posts, and telegraphs, finance, including currency, trade and commerce, mines and power. But there is always danger of abuse of power by the executive, and therefore every constitution provides for safeguards. Our constitution has provided four safeguards. First, the judiciary, consisting of the Supreme Court and the various high courts. These will safeguard the fundamental rights of the citizen by just and proper interpretation of the law. Second, by a controller and auditor general who will see to it that the funds of the union are wisely utilized. Third, the Union Public Service Commission, which will be in charge of recruitment to the services required by the country. And fourth, the election commissioner, who will be responsible for fair and impartial elections and who will be free from any executive interference. The President of the Union, as head of the state, will have vested in him all executive powers, including command of the armed forces. That is, the army. 
the Navy, and the Air Force. Moreover, he can summon or prorogue Parliament. He can grant pardons, promulgate ordinances, and so forth. But in spite of these powers, the President will act only on the advice of the Prime Minister and his Cabinet. And in case of malpractices, the President can be impeached. Thus, he is a constitutional President, a head of a state, similar to the King of England. But unlike the King, the status of President of the Indian Union is not determined by one of aristocratic birth for he can be from among the humblest in the land. His only qualification for the post is that he has the confidence of the people of the Indian Union. Our constitution, as we have seen, falls under three heads. There is the legislature to enact laws. There is the executive to carry them out. And the independent judiciary to see that the laws are properly and correctly interpreted. Our constitution, therefore, to bring this about, lays down certain directive principles, and some of them are, one, that the citizens, men and women equally, have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. Two, that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good. Three, and that children of tender age are not abused, and that they are not forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their years or strength. Four, that the state shall endeavor to provide for free and compulsory education for all children. Five, the state shall, within the limits of its economic capacity, make effective provision for securing the right to work in cases of unemployment, old age, and sickness. Six, the state shall take steps to organize village panchayats. Seven, the state shall endeavor its agriculture and animal husbandry on modern scientific lines. Eight, the state shall endeavor to promote international peace and security and maintain just and honorable relations between nations. It can be truly said of our democratic republic that it has a single citizenship, that of the Union, a single state language, that of Hindi in the Devanagari script, although full scope will be given to the various regional languages, and a single pattern of administration, the parliamentary system, established on the foundations of adult franchise. When we consider then that our franchise involves a vote six times the number that we had before independence, a number that is nearly equal to the total portion of the Soviet Union, a number that exceeds by 30 million the population of the entire United States of America, we can begin to comprehend and appreciate the vastness of our democracy and the glorious legacy that is ours. A legacy that requires each one of us to do his utmost in making our Constitution become a living reality. Jai Hind! will always be the spirit of age, said Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chief architect of the Constitution of India. The strength of the Constitution lies entirely on the determination of each citizen to defend it. On this joyous occasion of Constitution Day, let us see what the young minds, the NRI kids of Bharat Club Kuala Lumpur have to say. Namaste. It was 72 years ago on this very day, the 26th day of November 1949, through the members of the Constituent Assembly, we, the people of India, adopted, enacted and gave to ourselves our constitution. In 2015, 
the 125th birth anniversary year of baba saheb ambedkar the government of india decided to celebrate november 26th as constitution day every year to reiterate our gratitude to the chief architect of our constitution on january 26th 1950 the constitution of india became the law of the land under the extraordinary chairmanship of dr rajendra prasad the constituent assembly accomplished the exceptional feat of blending and balancing ideologies from different constitutions the concepts of liberty equality and fraternity from the french constitution and five year plans from the ussr the world's largest democracy finds its resonance in its constitution to ensure that it remains relevant over time the makers incorporated provisions allowing future generations to make necessary amendments as may be deemed necessary the constitution declares india a sovereign socialist secular democratic republic assuring its citizens justice equality and liberty and endeavors to promote fraternity the original 1950 document is preserved in a helium filled case at the parliament house in new delhi it is the longest written constitution of any country on earth by the sheer wisdom prudence foresight and diligence the makers of our constitution prepared a futuristic and vibrant document it is a guiding light to conclude in dr ambedkar's words constitution is not a mere lawyer's document it is a vehicle of life and its spirit is always the spirit of age let us resolve this samvidhan divas that we the people of india will continuously strive to achieve the ideals of our constitution and realize the dreams of millions of our fellow citizens jai hind namaste the constitution is simply the supreme law of india it lays down the framework of the fundamental political code procedures powers fundamental rights and duties of government bodies and citizens this is the longest ever constitution by any country in the world which was hand written by mr prem bihari narendra rezana it took close to 3 years and 2000 amendments to come up with the final draft and was completed on 26 november 1949 dr b r ambedkar was the chairman of the drafting committee The key part of the constitution is the fundamental rights it assures to the citizens of India. There are six fundamental rights recognized which are right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights and the right to constitutional remedies. The right to equality is the most important of the fundamental rights. It lays the principal foundation of all other rights that include equality before the law and the prohibition of discrimination on any grounds. It also ensures equality of opportunity in matters of employment, the abolition of untouchability and abolition of titles. The right to freedom guarantees six freedoms: freedom of speech and expression, freedom to assemble peacefully without arms, freedom to form companies or unions, freedom to move all across the country, freedom to reside and settle in any part of India, and the freedom to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business. The right against exploitation provides for two provisions the abolition of trafficking or slavery in human beings and the abolition of employment of children below the age of 14 years in dangerous jobs like factories mines etc right to freedom of religion provides religious freedom to all citizens of india the objective of this right is to sustain the principle of secularism in india According to the constitution all religions are equal before the state and no religion shall be given preference over the other citizens are free to preach practice and propagate any religion of their choice this is the principle of secularism cultural and educational rights guarantee every citizen of india both right to education and culture right to constitutional remedies empowers the citizens to move to a court of law in case of any denial of the fundamental rights Dr B R Ambedkar had called this right to be the heart and soul of the constitution. We must remember that the constitution must not be misinterpreted for our own personal needs and we must respect every citizen's rights and not only our own. Thank you very much. Dhanyawad. Hi. My name is Vishnu Srijit and today I'll be talking a little bit about our constitution. 
Our great nation of India has an incredibly rich history with great diversity in its language, culture and tradition. However, our country's present state was defined by a very important event that took place after our independence, which is the establishment of our constitution. This body of fundamental principles according to which India is governed by was first adopted by the Constituent Assembly of India on the 26th of November 1949 and became effective on the 26th of January 1950. It was drafted by two 99 members of the Constituent Assembly who discussed what the constitution should contain and what laws should be included. Today, one of the key figures that we regard as being heavily responsible for its formation is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who was the chairman of the drafting committee and a constitutional expert. He is considered to be the father of the constitution of India. Now, I would like to talk about one of the most neglected features of our constitution, which many people are not fully aware about. They are the fundamental duties of the citizen. They were made with the intent to remind the citizens of India that while the constitution grants them certain fundamental rights, it requires them to follow basic norms of democratic conduct because rights and duties are correlated. These duties oblige all citizens to respect the national symbols of India and to cherish its heritage. It reminds them about preserving its culture and assisting in its defense. The duties also compel all Indians to promote common brotherhood, protect the environment and public property, develop an attitude which involves the application of logic, reject violence, and strive for excellence in every aspect of one's life. Our constitution is one of the most important building blocks for modern Indian society and its influence is vast. It teaches us how we should live our lives in peace and harmony. Thank you. Namaste. I'm Kumkum Joshi. I'm going to talk about the preamble of the Indian Constitution. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and the integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly, this 26th day of November 1949, do hereby adopt, enact and give to ourselves this Constitution. The preamble to the Constitution of India is a brief introductory statement that sets out the guiding purpose, principles and philosophy of the Constitution. The preamble to the Indian Constitution is based on the Objectives Resolution, drafted and moved by Pandit Nehru and adopted by the Constituent Assembly. It has been amended by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act 1976, which added three new words, socialist, secular and integrity. The importance of the preamble is that it states the authority, the source of authority, is the people of India. The preamble of the Indian constitution reflects the basic philosophy of the framers of the constitution. Preamble states when the constitution was adopted and enacted. It also states the nature of the state and also makes commitment towards social, economic and political justice to all its citizens. The preamble of the constitution states its objectives. The objectives stated by the preamble are to secure justice, liberty, equality to all citizens and promote fraternity to maintain unity and integrity of the nation. The words, we the people of India, indicate the ultimate sovereignty of the people of India. Sovereignty means the independent authority of the state not being subject to the control of any other state or external power. The text declares India to be a republic, indicating a government by the people and for the people. Dhanyavad and Jai Hind.
a very good afternoon respected principal ma'am teachers and my dear friends i say rajkumar of standard 6 from global indian international school kuala lumpur and here to conduct today's event where we come together to celebrate the constitutional day of india the national constitution day is also known as samvidhan divas the national constitution of india was adopted on 26 november 1949 the national this day is celebrated in india to honor the adoption of the constituent assembly of india the national constitution day came in effort on 26 january 1950 hence hence 26 november is celebrated as national constitution day and 26 uh, january is celebrated as republic day of india to commemorate adoption of the constitution of india global indian international school kuala lumpur malaysia has organized a talk show where students of standard 6 7 and 8 get an opportunity to express their views through speeches on the constitutional values and fundamental principles of indian constitution the constitution of india is the supreme law of india the document lays down the framework demarcating fundamental political code structure procedures powers and duties of government institutions and sets out fundamental right directive principles and the duties of citizens good afternoon respected teachers and my dear friends i am vaidehi savan from class 6 and i would like to say a few words on on the indian constitution constitution day is celebrated in india on november 26th every year It is also called as Samvidhan Divas and earlier was celebrated as Law Day. On 26 November 1949, the Constitution Assembly of India adopted Indian Constitution, which came into effect on 26 January 1950. It was declared by the Government of India in 2015 to celebrate 26 November as Constitution Day every year. The Constitution. of india is the longest written constitution in the world it aims to create awareness of fundamental duties of each individual of our country dr b r ambedkar is called the father of the indian constitution he was the one who drafted it the constitution declares india a secular democratic republic and assures its citizens justice equality and liberty thank you Good afternoon, my respected teachers and my dear friends. My name is Sheikh Kashif Ahmed from Class Six, and today I'm going to talk about constitutional values and fundamental principles of our Indian Constitution. The Constitution of India is also called as Bharatiya Samvidhan. First, let us understand what is a constitution. A constitution is a set of rules and regulations guiding the administration of a country. The Constitution was written on 26 November 1949, and it was made a center of law in 26 January 1950. And why do we need this Constitution? It is necessary because it is important for the law of the land. It also determines the relationship of the citizens with the government. It lays down several principles and guidelines for the people belonging to different ethnic and religious groups to live in harmony. The constitution plays an important role in our society. It explains how the government works and when elections are to be held and lists some of the rights we have. The constitution explains what each branch of government can do and how each branch can control other branches. The constitution declares India a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, assuring its citizens justice, equality, and liberty. The individuals of our fraternity. These are the important values of our Indian Constitution. There are six fundamental rights recognized by the Indian Constitution: right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, culture and educational rights, and right to constitutional remedies. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar is called the father of the Indian Constitution as he was the first law minister in India. and he was a chairman of the committee for drafting the constitution 
I am very proud to be an Indian. The struggle for freedom had made the people aware of the civil rights and duties of an individual. The forming of the constitution was not at all an easy task. Our ancestors got us freedom after a big struggle and the sole motto was to develop an ideal society. Thank you all for giving me a precious time. Jai Hind! Respected principal, teachers, and my dear friends, I am Avantika Madhu from class 7. Today, I am going to talk about the constitutional values and its fundamental principles. Almost every aspect of our lives is governed by a set of rules. In our games, there are specific rules. In our school, we have certain rules that we have to follow. Similarly, in our society, there is a need of certain laws so that people can live together in a safe manner. The constitution is the supreme law of the country. It consists of laws concerning the government and its relationships with the people. The Indian constitution is the longest written constitution of any country in the world. It has certain laws that make it really unique. The constitution, the constitutional values are those values that safeguard the human rights of every citizen of India. Moreover, it ensures that there is no unfairness or injustice towards any of them. The constitution declares India as sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, assuring its citizens justice, equality and liberty, and endeavors to promote the fraternity. Rights and duties are the two sides of the same coin. While being alert about our rights, we should also be conscious of our duties. Our constitution enshrines the ideal of building an inclusive society and also contains provisions for realizing it. Today is a great opportunity to convey our gratitude to the makers of our constitution. Let us work together to achieve the ideas of our constitution. Jai Hind! Good afternoon. I am Harshi from Class 6B. I consider it an honor and privilege to speak on the topic constitutional values and fundamental principles of the Indian Constitution today. The Constitution Day is celebrated on 26 November every year to commemorate the adoption of the Constitution of India. The constitution of any country lays down certain ideals that form the basis according to which the people want their country to be governed and the society to move on. These form the basis of the kind of country that we as citizens aspire to live in. Our constitution declares India a sovereign, secular, socialist, democratic republic assuring its citizens justice, equality, and liberty, and endeavors to promote fraternity. But do you know the meaning of the word value? Well, you may immediately say that truth, non-violence, peace, cooperation, honesty, respect, and kindness are the values, and you may continue. Let every citizen of India uphold their fundamental principles of the Indian Constitution and use their freedom responsibly so that we can carry forward the ancient culture and legacy of our great nation. Jai Hind. Good afternoon, respected principal, teachers, and my dear friends. My name is Vignesh, and I'm from class 7 in the Global Indian International School, Kuala Lumpur. Today, I will be talking about the Constitution of India. The Constitution of India. The Constitution of India, I mean, the Constituent Assembly began to prepare the Constitution on 9 December 1946. The Constituent Assembly met for 166 days, spread over a period of nearly three years. The making of the Constitution was completed on 26 November 1949. It is adopted by the Constituent Assembly of India on 26 November 1949 and became effective on 26 January 1950. The Constitution replaced the Government of India Act 1935 as the country's fundamental governing document as a dominion of India became the Republic of India. 
The constitution defines India as a sovereign, democratic, socialist, and secular republic. Sovereignty. Being sovereign means having complete political freedom and being the supreme authority. Socialism. This constitutional value is aimed at promoting social change and transformation to end all forms of inequalities. Secularism. Secularism implies that our country is not guided by any one religion or any religious consideration. Citizens are allowed to freely practice the religion of the choice. Democracy. Democracy ensures that people elect the rulers of the country and the elected representatives remain accountable to the people. Republic. Political equality is the chief message of this provision. The most important symbol of being a republic is the office head of the state, that is, the principal who is elected and who is not selected on the basis of heredity, as is on in a system with monarchy. Justice. Citizens of India are assured of justice in case of any wrongdoing against them. Liberty. The preamble preserves liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship and one of the core values. Equality. The constitution ensures the equality of status opportunity to every citizen for the development of the best in him or her. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. I'm Sanjana from Grade 8, and today I love to talk a little about constitution values and fundamental principles. First of all, what is a constitution? A written document in which rules for the smooth running of a society are encrypted is called a constitution. Our Indian constitution was adopted on 26 November, that is today, 1949, and was enacted on 26 January, 1950. It is the supreme law of the country. At the time of its adoption, it had 395 articles and eight schedules and was 1,45,000 word long, making it the longest national constitution to ever be adopted. The first meeting of the Constituent Assembly took place on 9 December, 1946, where Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elected as the president and Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was elected as the chairman of the drafting committee. It took precisely two years, 11 months and 18 days for the final draft and almost 6.4 million rupees to finish. The original constitution is handwritten with each page decorated by artists from Shantani Ketan, including B. R. Manu Harsinha and Nand Lalbos. The original constitution is handwritten by Prem Behari Narayan Rajda in English and Vasant Krishnan Vaidya in Hindi. This was done in a beautiful italic style. The constitutional values which are listed in the preamble include socialism, secularism, sovereignty, democracy, republican character, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, and unity and integrity of our nation. Next, fundamental principles and rights. Those rights which are essential for the intellectual, moral, and spiritual development of a citizen are called fundamental rights. Among them is the most important right to freedom. These are enshrined in part three, articles 12 to 35 of the Constitution of India. Fundamental rights play a very significant role in the life of a citizen. Finally, I would like to conclude by saying a quote by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Constitutional morality is not a natural sentiment. It has to be cultivated. And I am proud to be an Indian. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for the wonderful information. As rightly quoted by Jawahar Lal Nehru, citizenship consists in the service of the country. Good afternoon, everybody. I am Gautam Rajesh from class six, and I am going to be talking about the fundamental principles of the Indian constitution. The fundamentals of the Indian constitution, as are the fundamentals of any other thing we learn or do, are the inner strength or core that withheld the entire structure. It is because of these fundamentals that we have the right to equality, right to freedom, the right to choose our profession and religion, the right to preserve our culture and have education, the right to have judicial freedom and to approach the court to get justice, and the right against exploitment. But what the fundamentals do exploit is the caste system. A couple thousand years ago in the later Vedic age, there was a realistically rigid caste system with higher status roles and lower status roles. Kings, princes, and priests enjoyed the highest status roles and lived a very rich life. Whereas merchants, traders, farmers, and servants occupied the lower status roles and were very poorly treated. And then there were the Dalits or untouchable 
who aren't even considered by society. So these fundamentals protect us from such evils and many more like child labor, child marriage and slavery. So if this infrastructure of our constitution is pure preamble that shouldn't be touched, what to fall then? Our sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic country would fall with it. And so would we into a never ending precipice through a dark and grimy place. Thank you. Hello everyone, myself Katika from Standard 6. Today is Constitutional Day. So happy Constitutional Day to everyone. Now you all might be wondering, what is a constitution? A constitution is a basic principle and law of a nation that determines the powers and duties of the government and ensures certain rights to the people. It took about two years, 11 months and 17 days for the assembly to write down the entire constitution that too handwritten. It is the longest constitution with 395 articles and 12 schedules. It was passed by the Constituent Assembly on 26th November 1949. It came into effect on 26th January 1950. That's when we celebrate Republic Day. Dr. B.R. Ambedkar had played a significant role in drafting India's constitution. On 19 November 2015, the Government of India has declared 26th November as National Constitutional Day. Earlier, it was National Law Day. The Constitution of India is like building blocks for political structure and the duties of the government. It provides the Indians with six fundamental rights. Right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to the freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights, and right to constitutional remedies. We must all pledge to follow the rules given in the Constitution and to do so from time to time in the future. We must respect our constitution as it teaches us to uphold ourselves to be a loyal and a successful citizen. Jai Hind, thank you. Greetings to one and all present here. Today, I, Anjali Sony of grade seven, would like to share my point of view upon fundamental principles and constitutional values of the Indian constitution. A constitution is a set of rules that specifies how a country is to be governed, how power is controlled and distributed, and what rights citizens possess. The Indian constitution is the longest written constitution in the entire world. Constitution Day, also known as National Law Day or Samvidan Debas, is celebrated on the 26th November of every year to commemorate the adoption of the Indian constitution. Constitution Day is also celebrated to spread awareness about the importance of the Constitution and also to spread the ideas and thoughts of Dr. B. M. Rao Ambedkar. All constitutions work on some basic constitutional values. What are constitutional values? Constitutional values are those values which safeguard human rights and do not allow any citizen of India to be prejudiced. Here are a few constitutional values. Socialism. There are many social and economical differences in our society. Socialism is made a constitutional value to end all inequalities. Here are a few more constitutional values. Justice, equality, liberty, etc. All constitutions work on some basic fundamental rights. What are fundamental rights? Fundamental rights are norms which guide all of the fundamental principles and all of the works of the government. Here are a few fundamental principles. Sovereignty, directive principles, fundamental rights, cabinet government, and federalism. Fundamental principles are important so that the government doesn't gain too much power and is not able to take away our rights. I would like to conclude with a quote said by Dr. B. Rao Ambedkar. The constitution is not a mere lawyer's document. It is a vehicle of life and its spirit is always the spirit of age. Jai Hind, Jai Bharat. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Today, I, Lavkia Sai, will be speaking about the constitutional values and the fundamental principles of the Indian Constitution. Constitution Day is also known as National Law Day. It is celebrated in India on 26 November each year to commemorate the adoption of the Constitution of India. 
On 26 November 1949, the Constitution Assembly adopted the Constitution of India and it came into effect on 26 January 1950. The Constitution declares India a surveillant, socialist, secular, democratic republic, assuring its citizens justice, equality, and liberty, and endeavors to promote fraternity. The Constitution of India has certain values that make it unique. The constitutional values are those values that safeguard the human rights of every citizen in India. Moreover, these values ensure there should be no unfairness or injustice towards any citizen of India. The purpose of fundamental rights is to preserve individual liberty and democratic principles based on equality of all members of society. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar once said that the responsibility of the legislator is not just to provide the fundamental rights, but also, rather more importantly, to safeguard them. There are a total of six fundamental principles recognized in the Indian Constitution. They are the right to freedom, the right to equality, the right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights, right to constitutional remedies. In conclusion, I would like to say the celebration of the Constitution of India is essential since we become aware of what values our predecessors wanted to instill in us. We must understand and stand by every word it says since it provides us a guideline on how Indians should uphold themselves. Thank you. Jayden. Siddharth of Class 7C is willing to share some of our constitutional values and fundamental principles of Indian Constitution. All constitutions are a reflection of the ideas and ideals of the people who framed it. The Constitution of India was framed by a constituent assembly under the chairmanship of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. He is known as our father of Indian Constitution. Our Indian Constitution is the world's longest written constitution with 395 articles, 22 parts, and 12 schedules. The preamble of any constitution is a brief introductory statement that conveys the objectives of a constitution. The values expressed in the preamble of the constitution are Socialism, secularism, sovereignty, democracy, republican character of the Indian state, justice, liberty, equality, fraternity, human dignity, unity and integrity of the nation. The fundamental principle of the Indian constitution are right to equality, right to freedom, right against exploitation, right to freedom of religion, cultural and educational rights, right to property and right to constitutional remedies. The fundamental right, directive principle of the state policy, and fundamental duties are the sections of the Constitution of India. The Constitution Day, also known as Samvidhan Divas, is celebrated every year on 26 November to commemorate the adoption of our Indian Constitution, which was established on 1949-26 November a few years back. Thank you. Jahan. Good afternoon, teachers and students. I, Johan Jacob from Global Indian International School, Kuala Lumpur, of Class 8, would like to talk on constitutional values and fundamental principles of Indian Constitution. The Constitution of India came into force from 26 January. A special committee is gathered to draw and outline the Constitution. The Constitution gives all the details related to what is legal and what is illegal in the country. In addition, with the enforcement of the Constitution, the Indian subcontinent became the Republic of India. Besides, the drafting committee consists of seven members that were supervised by Dr. Baba Rao Ambedkar. Moreover, Constitution helps in maintaining prosperity and peace in the country. The first thing that makes the constitution different is its length. The constitution of India contains a preamble and 48 articles, 25 groups, 12 schedules, and five appendices. Moreover, it, takes, it took around three years to complete the draft of the constitution. The constitution is hard as well as soft both at the same time. While on one side, the supreme power needs to be followed carefully to maintain the law and order in the country. On the other side, the citizens can appeal to amend the outdated provisions, but there are certain provisions that can be easily amended and there are some that take a lot of time and resources to amend. Furthermore, there have been more than 100 amendments in the constitution from the day of its enforcement. I would like to conclude this talk by thanking you for your time. Thank you for the wonderful talks, friends. It was raining cats and dogs outside the parliament. The day constitution was signed and this was considered a good omen.
Good afternoon, teachers and my dear friends. Uh, my name is Roshan from class six. Today, I am going to speak about the constitutional values and the fundamental principles of Indian Constitution. The Constitution of India is the supreme law of India. It frames fundamental political principles, procedures, practices, rights, powers, and duties of the government. It impacts constitutional supremacy and not parliamentary supremacy. as it is not created by the parliament but by a constituent assembly and adopted by its people with the declaration in its preamble parliament cannot override it the world's longest constitution is the indian's constitution at its commencement it has 395 articles in 22 parts and 8 schedules it consists of approximately 145000 words making it the second largest act to constitution in the world currently it has a preamble of 25 parts with 12 schedules Five appendices, four hundred and forty-eight articles, and hundred and one amendments. The Constitution of India was adopted on twenty-sixth of November in the year nineteen forty-nine. However, it came to effect on twenty-sixth of January nineteen fifty. Twenty-sixth of January is celebrated as the Republic Day of India. It was adopted by the Constitution Assembly. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, the chairman of drafting committee, is widely considered to be the architect of the Constitution of the India. After the adoption of the Constitution, the Union of India became the contemporary and modern Republic of India. The Constitution of India provides its citizens with six fundamental rights. These rights are right to freedom, right to equality, cultural and educational rights, right to constitutional remedies, right against exploitation, and right to privacy. J. Hind, thank you. Thank you a lot, friends. The date twenty six January was chosen to commemorate the declaration of Poona Swaraj, complete independence of nineteen thirty. One signature which is not there in the Constitution is that of Mahatma Gandhi. My dear friends, I feel privileged to deliver the vote of thanks for today's event. I would like to thank our school to provide us this platform, Principal Ma'am for providing us this opportunity, our teachers who have taken so much efforts and have always guided us. and all of you who have come together to be a part of this day to commemorate the adoption of the constitution of india and make it a memorable one thank you all thank you Parliament House, New Delhi, 19th of August, 1985, the 35th year of our Republic. 14 founding fathers of the Indian Constitution called on the Speaker of the Lok Sabha, Mr. Balram Jhakar. The past 35 years have been the years of trial and tribulation. The Constitution, framed by them, has stood the test of time. and become the bedrock of india's progress and unity it is the embodiment of the hopes and aspirations of the people as a whole because it was the fulfillment of the people's striving for independence the adoption of the constitution of india was the culmination of a 90 year long struggle for independence For several years the congress had been demanding the right of the indian people to frame their own constitution in 1928 a committee was set up under the chairmanship of motilal nehru to lay down the principles of a constitution for india the constitution recommended by the nehru committee envisaged a federal system of government with residuary powers vested in the center and joint mixed voters for the houses of representatives and the provincial legislatures the 1929 lahore congress demanded purna swaraj complete independence in 1934 the congress reiterated its demand for a constituent assembly to be elected on adult franchise for shaping the destiny of the indian people
After the end of the Second World War, a cabinet mission was sent to negotiate the transfer of power to India. The 16th of May, 1946 statement of the cabinet mission announced framing of a future constitution for India by Indians themselves. Elections were held in July 1946, with Congress winning 199 seats. The Constituent Assembly met at Delhi on the 9th of December 1946. It was an impressive assembly of 207 eminent leaders and brilliant legal minds of the era. The Muslim League and a majority of the princely states abstained. Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elected as the permanent chairman. Welcoming the election, Sarvapalli Radhakrishnan said, He is the suffering servant of India, of the Congress, and incarnate the spirit for which this country stands. Bulbule Hind, the nightingale of India, to address us. Not in prose, but in poetry. Mr. Chairman, the manner of your uh, calling me is not constitutional. It is poetic. <laughs> it reminds me of some lines of a Kashmiri poet who said, Bul Bul ko Gul Mubarak, Gul ko Chaman Mubarak, Rangin Tabiyat Onko Range Sukhan Mubarak. And today we are steeped in the rainbow colored tints of speech and speeches in praise of my great leader and comrade Rajendra Prasad. Dr. Rajendra Prasad expressed the hope that the constitution framed by the assembly will be a model for all to follow. All that we need, all that we require is honesty of purpose, firmness of determination, a desire to understand each other's viewpoints, a resolve that we shall do justice. On the 13th of December 1946, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru moved the objectives resolution. President, sir, I beg to move. This constituent assembly declares its firm and solemn resolve to proclaim India as an independent sovereign republic and to draw up for her future governance a constitution wherein all power and authority of the sovereign independent India, its constituent parts and organs of government are derived from the people. Many eminent leaders participated in the debate. Dr. Shama Prasad Mukherjee. It is a solemn and a sacred trust which we Indians have agreed to perform to the best of our ability. Dr. Ambedkar. Our difficulty is how to make the heterogeneous mess that we have today take a decision in common and march in a cooperative way on that road which is bound to lead us to unity. On the 22nd of January, 1947, the objectives resolution was approved. The Constituent Assembly elected members of the Advisory Committee and formed 13 committees and subcommittees to look after the various aspects of constitution making. On the 2nd of June 1947, the partition of India was accepted by the Congress and the Muslim League. 
deliberation of the Constituent Assembly continued on the basis of the objective's resolution. Many designs were received for the flag of independent India. On the 22nd of July, 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru moved a resolution on the national flag. National flag of India shall be a horizontal tricolor of deep saffron, kesari, white and dark green in equal proportion. In the center of the white band, there shall be a wheel in navy blue to represent the charta. On the 14th of August, 1947, President of the Assembly, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, proposed that the Constituent Assembly of India has assumed powers for the governance of India and that the Constituent Assembly of India had endorsed the recommendation that Lord Mountbatten be the Governor General of India from 15th of August 1947. The proposals were accepted by the Assembly. On the night of 14th and 15th of August 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru moved the resolution on India's independence. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge, not wholly or in full measure, but very substantially. A drafting committee for scrutinizing the draft constitution was appointed on the 29th of August 1947. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was its chairman and Alladi Krishnaswami Iyer, Gopala Swami Iyengar, K. M. Munshi, Sayyid Muhammad Sadullah, Sir B. L. Mittar and D. P. Khaitan were the other members. Before preparing the draft, constitutions of various countries were consulted. France, Ireland, Italy, Canada, United States of America, Soviet Union, Australia, Japan, and several others. On the 4th of November, 1948, Dr. Ambedkar introduced the draft constitution in the assembly. Each article of the constitution was discussed threadbare and amended to meet the demands of the majority. Four members from Jammu and Kashmir, headed by the Prime Minister Sheikh Abdullah, joined the Constituent Assembly in June 1949. It was proposed that a preamble should spell out the aims and objectives of the Constitution. Many suggestions were received. Mr. Subarao from Vijayawada wrote, a new aim called prosperity may be included with a Sanskrit verse. May the children beget their children and their children beget grandchildren. Let the poor be rich. The preamble spelt out the aspirations, rights and responsibilities of the citizens of India. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity of the nation. Article 1 of the draft constitution was taken up on the 15th of November 1948. The members proposed an amendment for changing the name India to Bharat. The article was amended to read, India, that is Bharat, shall be a union of states. 
the constitution lays down the qualifications for citizenship of India. At the commencement of this constitution, every person who is a domicile in the territory of India and who was born in the territory of India or either of whose parents was born in the territory of India shall be a citizen of India. Fundamental rights were framed with utmost care. Many suggestions were received about the need to safeguard individual liberties and rights of the minorities from C. Rajagopalachari, Rajkumari Amrit Kaur, Dr. Ambedkar and other eminent personalities. Hansa Mehta. It will warm the heart of many a woman, sir, to know that free India will mean not only equality of status, but equality of opportunity. The Constitution guarantees the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India. The state shall not discriminate against any citizen on grounds only of religion, race, caste, sex, place of birth or any of them. Untouchability is abolished and its practice in any form is forbidden. Cultural and educational rights of the minorities are safeguarded. Article 19, 1 says that all citizens shall have the right to freedom of speech and expression to assemble peacefully and without arms, to form associations or unions, to move freely throughout the territory of India, to reside and settle in any part of the territory of India, and to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India Mr. P. N. Bhagwati says... The Supreme Court is at the apex of this system. The Supreme Court is the guardian of the fundamental rights and even the right to move the Supreme Court for enforcement of fundamental rights has itself been declared to be a fundamental right. Article 39 of the Constitution lays down that the state shall, in particular, direct its policy towards securing that the citizens, men and women equally, have the right to an adequate means of livelihood. That the health and strength of workers, men and women, and the tender age of children are not abused, and that citizens are not forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to their age or strength. That childhood and youth are protected against exploitation and against moral and material abandonment. Many members argued that there were inherent contradictions within the fundamental rights and directive principles of the state policy. Mr. Justice P. N. Bhagwati explains. The directive principles of state policy set out the kind of socio-economic structure which the constitution makers wanted us to build in this country. India opted for a parliamentary system of government wherein representatives of the people are elected on the basis of adult franchise. There shall be a parliament for the union, which shall consist of the president and two houses, to be known respectively as the Council of State and House of the People, the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha. Elections to the House of the People, the Lok Sabha, and the legislative assemblies of the states shall be on the basis of adult suffrage. That is to say, every person who is a citizen of India and who is not less than 21 years of age on the date of the election shall be entitled to vote at the election. Special provisions have been made for reservation of elected seats in the parliament and state legislative assemblies for minorities like scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and Anglo-Indians. There shall be a President of India. The executive power of the Union 
shall be vested in the president. He is elected by members of the electoral college, consisting of members of both houses of parliament and the legislative assemblies of the states. The president invites the leader of the majority party in parliament to hold the office of prime minister and on the recommendations of the prime minister, other ministers are appointed. The powers of the union and the state governments were clearly defined. The Indian constitution contains 395 articles and nine schedules. The constitution is so framed that sovereignty is vested in the people. In other words, the parliament draws its powers from the people of India. The constitution is not rigid and does not bind down future generations. It is flexible and can be amended by a two-thirds majority to meet the aspirations of succeeding generations. After the third reading, the constitution was approved and signed by all the members. On the 26th of November 1949, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, the President of the Assembly, put his signature and seal to the Constitution. In recognition of his service to the nation, Dr. Rajendra Prasad was elected the first President of the Republic of India. Under sub rule 1 of rule 8 of the President of India election rules, I hereby declare the Honorable Dr. Rajendra Prasad to be duly elected to the office of the President. Good afternoon to everyone who's joined us and who will join us eventually. Um, the day celebrated as Constitution Day is the 26th of November, which is tomorrow. So on the eve of it, we are having um, uh, advocate Antna, Mrs. Vinita Raj. Uh, she's, she's been kind enough to take some time out of her busy schedule to address us on what the Constitution is possibly uh, 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 an idea of what it is about. And uh, as uh, as you can see that it's like the 72nd year, if you will actually look at it, starting from the 26th of November, 1949, because that's the day when the constitution was approved and came into being, uh, though we adapted it only uh, a couple of months later on the 26th of January. And this day is also called as a Samvidhan Divas. And it was declared by our prime minister, Sri Narendra Modi, on the 19th of November 2015. So if we look at celebration wise, it is only the sixth year of celebration, but the existence of it is about 72 years old. And on the occasion of Dr. Ambedkar's 125th birth anniversary, uh, that was the year in which uh, it was his 125th birth anniversary. Uh, that was the year that uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi declared uh, this day, 26th November, as the Samvidhan Divas. Um, about the speaker for today, she is a very eminent speaker and I was finding it very difficult 
to say much about her uh, so i don't i you will not see much you will see what you have already seen um, all i can say she is uh, very prolific she's an she's a very eminent speaker uh, i'll try and possibly share more information on our uh, uh, on any other uh, forum forum we can possibly uh, i can post this uh basically she is an advocate if you see she is an ma in economics with an llb and an llm degree and she is an entrepreneur and she has her own uh, uh, business she is the managing director of this organization called world dealers private limited and they they have an application which basically is called translate and localize so it's a translation application and uh, she uh, uh, their company assists that Uh, other than that, uh, you've already made been made aware of it by invitation that she yes uh, is an author of she's the author of the book called the Awkward Luck, and she's won a couple of awards as well. And uh, yes, she is she's a guest speaker to various IIMs, various Institute of Chartered Accountants, and so without further ado, I hand the floor over to you, ma'am. Uh, we'll start with the, this very point of. Uh, Uh, madam nayar how she took it up she introduced me she introduced me that uh, you know mrs neeta raj is there and she's so and so and this is all about her uh, this very point uh, starts the conversation that uh, when i'm here an introduction for me is required when i'm here an introduction for me is required now if i ask you who are you you will say i am so and so you will give me your name and then you will give me maybe your parents name what they do and you know what kind of family you are from and what are the you know culture the, you are you hail from which culture you are you hail from which religion uh, you know and different uh, specifications will be there same is the case with a nation when we define a nation you know we ideally we need to define okay what kind of nation is this suppose we talk about india okay what is india okay india is a nation fine okay what is so peculiar about it okay india is a nation you know with the uh, great topographical features variations we have uh, mountains also we have coastal lines also we have islands also we have uh, plateau also north india plain also and you know uh, all uh, kinds of physical features that you one can notice in the world are available in india okay oh fine that goes a geographical introduction okay what else okay we have we are a country with unity in diversity we have so many religion people of so many faiths and you know beliefs and they all stay together happily oh that's a different characteristics okay what else so so you know one by one you will keep opening up the layers of introduction about the country and then you will define and then a uh, one person who does not know much about india will find and frame a structure in his mind okay india is a country with these many characteristics such an introduction is required now such an introduction needs to be consolidated to give a proper identity to identity to a nation a proper consolidation of these facts and denominations is required and this assortment of denominations different denominations be it of religion be it of uh, your social practices your legal practices judicial practices legislative practices is what is known as constitution uh we uh, ours is an economy ours is a structure ours is a nation where the profit from the capitalists is pulled the tax money is taken from the you know, citizens of india and is used for the betterment of the lower segment mainly uh, and excuse me then you know the, the, because they know that the upper segments will manage themselves wisely so this is a socialist approach mainly the concern for the people at large and the last one is sovereign sovereign see we are a nation self dependent we have our uh, you know our own constitution we have our own identity so uh, why, what is sovereign sovereign is i am not dependent on anyone else my friends how you know visionary they were they thought they assumed they foresaw you know they had foreseen ki at what if these kind of things happen okay let us make this system what if this happens let us keep this thing in place and see many a times i have seen and uh, uh, this this should be taken on a right note 
uh, when we see the structure, uh, the practices in India, and we find that a certain category of people are given, being given more benefits and all, or you know, a certain region is being given more leverage, we have so many questions, we become rebellious, say, hey, why this is so, and we are an equal nation, then why this happens? But we must also see to one point that we can frame that today, today, if I got to frame some policy, you know, I can frame the policy seeing the circumstances today, max to max, you know, having a vision of next 10, 20, 30 years, accordingly, I can frame the policies. The time when this constitution was framed, that time, these people who are now being given with benefits and more rights were really deprived of a proper social status even. So there was a great need that some more rights need to be given to them so that at least they come up to the level of everyone. They can come to the mainstream and then the things can be drafted and changed accordingly. So, you know, never have any grudge about uh, what has been written in the constitution because it was thoughtfully written. Trust me, it is a document. If you will read it at length, you will find it was so thoughtfully written. And they, those people were really so smart and intelligent and really visionary people who saw, who, you know, contemplated that with this much of variety, many things can happen. Permutation and combinations, there can be many permutation and combinations that can happen. And for that, you know, that, those kind to handle with those kind of situation, we have to have certain things in place. And with these many things also, they still gave place for amendment. They still gave the leverage that, okay, if at any time in future, you think that these practices are now old and staled out and they are no more required or they need any change, then we give you the right to make such changes in Article 368, go and change the constitutional provisions as, and however, a proper discussion needs to take place in parliament and the parliament, uh, finally, you know, the cabinet, do does pass the uh, bill and it goes to the president for final approval and that's how it becomes uh, you know an act and you can you know accordingly make the changes but there is also some rigidity there is one special segment part three of the constitution that is uh, the preamble of the constitution that is the soul of the constitution so, and for that uh, the rigidity is also there that there no change can be made. There have had been some special cases uh, um, to quote Beruvari and uh, Keshwanand Bharti case where a lot of discussion took place that why we cannot change preamble of the constitution if we can change rest of the provisions. So they said that it is the soul. You can change and alter the body but you cannot change the soul of a person. So um, that again makes it a very different uh, story with this constitution that, you know, we have a soul in place and we live by and we, we, we practice this constitution uh, with the social spirits and everyone is included. There, there is an advertisement of video one, I suppose, everyone is invited. So, you know, here everyone is included and no one is left out. This is something, you know, I find so beautiful with this beautiful document. And this was all I had to say about my constitution, your constitution. And trust me, have faith. It's a well thought of and uh, well thought document drafted, chalked out in a you know, very beautiful way. Doctor, uh, you can go ahead and uh, address the gathering here. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so sorry. I was uh, hopping in and out of uh, the event. Uh, first of all, I take this opportunity to congratulate everyone on uh, 71st Constitution Day. Uh, and also, I wholeheartedly welcome uh, Mrs. Vinita Raj, who's a great friend and a great leader. Uh, wonderful advocate and uh, she is a social entrepreneur and uh, is leading in many forums. I'm thankful and we are lucky to have her today to talk to our children. So thank, thank you so you much for giving me the opportunity, ma'am. Thank you.
thank you for bottom of my heart uh, for accepting the invitation in uh, such a short notice and as usual being wonderful uh, on everything and your uh, presence and conversation so i'm sure we are all enriched with your uh, thoughts and uh, determined ideas and i just and uh, you know uh, children i'm sure uh, you all have been benefited what ma'am has spoken and uh, we know why constitution day is been celebrated and uh, what is the importance of this day uh, it was known as uh, national law day before and then it was kind of converted the name was the nomenclature was changed to Con uh, constitution day uh, small things to start with and big things to aspire for and small things are that we are all conscious about our rights and constitution talks about rights as well as duties so start from your home start from your classroom and think big as big as to reach that level where you can make a difference uh, somewhere in existence of anything for your nation to bring it up and uh, to enhance the level of your uh, country by marking your presence felt in wherever whichever forum you try and you decide to lead